So yeah. once once you get going these days, you know the marathon has become for for us it's become a long sprint, and you better be ready to be able to sprint for 26 miles. How long do you train? Um, you know, looking look, uh, looking at a marathon, how long will you? How far back will you start preparing for that, and how long after it does the recovery take? Well, you know, the pre preparation is for me is, is all year because mm -hmm. I mean we can race basically at the stage from January till December. I mean we have some local marathons in South Africa in, in February, and the last race could be Hawaii. So you can race the whole race the whole year mm -hmm. if you want to. But specifically, I start preparing about three months before Boston for Boston for the type of course that it is and works, work towards it. I will you know, do some sports science testing. I will see where I am. I work, I work in, sports science, in mm -hmm. the sports science industry. So I'll look where I am and I'll evaluate myself and then make the necessary adjustments. Recovery is not much of an issue because um, I'll be doing London in six days time after Boston. And then a week after that, I'll be doing a race in Korea, marathon. Um, when I was younger, I tried to do four and four weeks. So I did Paris, Boston, London, and Korea. So the recovery is not that big of a deal. Uh, because we're on wheels, there's no impact to the joints. So if you're fit, um, it's like a cyclist. I mean, a cyclist can do the Tour de France and do so much distance every day uh, because there's no real impact to the joints. And the same, same principle accounts for us. So basically, I can do, if I'm fit enough and I take care of myself, I can do a lot of marathons. Do you kind of thrive on being the guy to be? Well, it's, you know, it's, what is this, it's, I'm going for number eight now, so yeah. um, it's, it's, always, it's not always fun having the big target on your back and having to come up with all these things to do to break away from the pack, but um, I like this course, I think this course plays into my hand, and when I'm fit and ready, there's, there's not a lot of guys in the world that could really, you know, take me on in this course. Um, I think the guys who can are here this year, uh, some of them are in really good form, so it's, it's, it's always a challenge. You got that the medal you wanted last September in Beijing. Yeah. Um, may have been a different discipline, but you know, talk about your Paralympic career and the opportunities it's presented you since Barcelona. Yeah, well, you know, as I said, Beijing was my fifth and it was my third sport because I started out as a swimmer and then I moved over to track um, and then afterwards, you know, I've moved over to cycling, and it's just helped me to develop as an athlete. Um, I think I understand what it takes to train to be able to be ready for any event from 15 seconds, which I've done before in Barcelona, I did the 100 meters on the track, up to you know a cycling road race, which can be an event of up to two hours. So I've gone through them all and I've, I've learned how to prepare myself. The whole Paralympic experience itself has been really, really incredible. But you know, it's also, I was I was up to, up to about 2002, I was really struggling because it's a, to be a high-performance athlete these days is it's financially very, very difficult, and you need to have a full-time financial sponsor to back you. And I'm one of the few athletes in the world that actually, wheelchair athletes, who, who has a financial partner being Spalding Rehab that, that enables me to be able to train, you know, as much as I need to, and travel and, and, and race as much, because the thing, it's not just about training, it's about racing often, and seeing what your competitors are doing, and competing against them, and getting used to, because a lot of the guys, they'll do one or two races a year, and they get bummed out so much with the whole aspect of being in a competitive event that they just, you know, lock out. So I think you need to be able to travel the world and get used to it and race a lot to be able to do well in the sport. Are there uh, technological advances you have to keep up with too, as far as... Well, you know, the, the, the IAAF the IAA make and the IPC make sure that they limit the rules of the chairs quite significantly. Okay. So there's not a lot we can do. I don't think my chair has changed. Um, visibly in any way since since I won my first one in 2001. Okay. Um, it's pretty much been standardized um, and so the athletes just got better and they're just training more scientifically and, and the competition is more professional. How are they training more scientifically, especially for this race? Well, people are, people have started to use sports science as a tool. I mean, they do regular VO2 max testing, power output testing, uh, they measure um, immune response, they measure blood, they measure recovery through blood these days. So there's a lot of aspects that people never, you know, of course, it was, we were almost like a bit of a Cinderella sport. Nobody really worried about it, but suddenly there's, it's, it's a high profile event. I mean, Beijing the Paralympics went out to so many countries live on TV, and suddenly people are investing money in it and, and seeing it as a spectator sport, and people have interest in it. In South Africa, for instance, because our Olympic team only won one medal, and the Paralympic team 
it finished uh, six overall and out of all the countries in the world, it drew a lot more media attention and people followed the Paralympics a lot more religiously than they did the Olympics. And suddenly you're in a situation where our Paralympic team have more sponsors than our Olympic team because of media exposure and because of the level of the competition. Do you feel like that more of the Paralympic athletes are stepping up in terms of weight training and, and what they're doing because of what yeah. you've done in your own development? I think, I think uh, you know, raising the standard in any sport, people will, will realize that if they want to get close to the times and, and what you're doing, that they need to step up the game. They need to engage in, in weight training and um, psychology and uh, more, periodization, more periodized training and stuff like that. So it, 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 it just raises the, the standard of the sport generally if one or two people are starting to do it the right way. Is that like the Van Dyke model? And are people kind of following? Well, how yeah, it? yeah. I get a lot of um, I get a lot of people finding out how am I how am I training? You know, what am I doing? Looking at what what am I? Even the way I, I designed my chair and the way we have developed it, a lot of people will send an order form to to Invercare Top End, and they will ask they want a chair like mine. <laughs> That's all they ask. So it's it's just the way it's developed. But I mean, are people using your training techniques and? Well, you know, a lot of it you, you keep to yourself, but like the fact that I use hand cycling as a very um, strong component in my training as cross training, because you can go so much further and so much longer without, you know, hurting yourself too much. And a lot of people have started doing that, and they've been buying hand cycles and cross training and getting fitter, because I found with a hand cycle, I can go a lot harder for a lot longer, so I keep my heart rate higher, so I can, you know, influence my lactic tolerance. And that was one of my weaknesses. And I was able to improve that. And I made no secret of it that the way I overcome it was by using the handbike. And so a lot of people have followed suit.